All right, the title of the sermon this morning, we're going to be preaching on Acts 26, is it an, an evangelism masterclass? An evangelism masterclass. Because we see a masterclass in evangelism uh, from Paul when he is giving his defense and is, you know, explaining himself uh, before King Agrippa and Festus in Acts 26. So I've got a few points here. You can think of it like a soul winning tips that we get from Paul here in Acts 26. So number one, we see here in verse one and two. First one is you want to be ready. You want to be ready. Acts 26 says here, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. And look at how Paul responds. He says, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. So notice here, Paul is he's happy at the fact that he gets the opportunity to be able to preach the gospel, to tell King Agrippa and Festus about Jesus Christ. But let me ask you, how many Christians today would be happy to just be given the opportunity, handed to them on a silver platter, to preach the gospel? You know, would you be nervous? Would you choke? Would you know what to say? Would you be ashamed? So you want to be ready to give the gospel. This is why he's happy. Why is Paul happy to give a defense of himself? Because he was ready to give a defense. He was ready to give an answer. And this is what the Bible tells us to do in 1 Peter 3. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. See, are you ready to preach the gospel? You know, what if today, you know, you're out and about, you happen to run into somebody and they ask, you know, hey, you know, where you been? Or, you know, they, they ask, you know, I've been looking into this Christianity stuff. What do you think? You know, what if you get that opportunity where it just comes, it just falls into your lap and you're like, uh, uh, yeah, well, you know, uh, uh, what a shame. What a shame. Whereas you want to be like Paul. You know, he's in, you know, did he, did he know he was going to be in this exact scenario? No, but he was ready. And you know what? When you're ready, you are happy when that situation happens. So you may have the chance to explain the gospel in depth to a captive listener. And are you ready? It just reminds me of uh, street evangelism, you know, two Thursdays ago, where I was, we were out, out in Macquarie Street, you know, preaching the gospel. And then this guy like kind of stops. I was finishing off with this lady that I was talking to. He kind of stops and he's like reading the signs. And then after I finish with this lady, he comes over to me and he's like, uh, he's like, hey, uh, explain this to me. What, what is this about? I mean, you know, normally you have to try, you know, knock on the door. I don't want to talk to you. You're trying to stop them. I don't want to talk. But sometimes you get the opportunity where somebody just asks you to explain. And, and to be honest, this was, you know, this was kind of like, Interesting, this guy that I spoke to, his name was Miladin. Um, he was from, uh, I think he was from Czechoslovakia or somewhere. But he was genuinely interested to learn, you know, about the gospel because he had a Catholic upbringing and he was kind of lying towards atheism, but then he, was, he really wanted an explanation. And he, the, uh, the questions he was asking me, see, I have sort of like a standard way to go through the gospel with somebody. You know, if they're an atheist, you're so, so first talking about creation and then, you know, give them the facts about, you know, the, the resurrection and obviously you explain to them the plan of salvation and the way he was asking me questions he was just sort of leading me through the presentation that i usually give people so it was, it was quite a very you know fulfilling you know uh, time of sharing with this person because i was curious but he wanted to know all the information that i sort of you know already try and explain to people but he was wanting to listen so that was really good and sometimes you have you have that opportunity um, but if you're not ready not only, you know, this is the reason why you may not want to put yourself in that scenario because you don't actually want to talk about it, but you may not actually be ready to talk about it in terms of having the knowledge and having the, the practice of explaining it. You know, sometimes people go soul winning and they're not used to getting into conversations because sometimes you go soul winning, whether it's a street evangelism or whether it's out door to door. And, you know, sometimes you go week after week and, you know, you know, the honest truth is sometimes some weeks are hard. People don't want to talk. People don't want to listen. And you're knocking doors, you're getting rejection after it. And other weeks, you know, you, you only knock like maybe four or five doors because it just seems everyone wants to talk that day. So 
One thing is you've got to stick with it. You can't just go a couple of weeks and go, oh, it doesn't work. Because yeah, there's going to be some weeks where people don't want to talk. But you know, there's going to be other weeks where people do want to talk. And what's sometimes funny is when people aren't in the practice of giving the gospel, you know, they just expect people don't want to talk. And then sometimes when you go with somebody, they go soul winning, they knock on the door and they say, hey, you know, here, I want to explain to you about Jesus Christ. And the guy goes, yeah, all right, you know, well, you know what do you got? And then, and then I'm not sure where to start because they're so used to not giving the gospel that when somebody actually gives them the opportunity, they're not ready. They don't know where to begin. They don't know what to say next. And, you know, that can impact the way people receive your message too because I believe even though... You know, the power is in the word, the power is in Jesus Christ, but your persuasiveness also can change how that message is received. And you know, when you're confident in the things you're saying, and you know what you're saying, and you, you know not what you're saying, you, you will come across as more knowledgeable, and then they will be more inclined to hear what you have to say. So be ready. You know, then when that one conversation easily starts, right? You know, you, you're ready to explain. Now that's normal when you're new, but you know, you don't want that to keep happening. You know, when you're new to soul winning and you know it's all right you know, every, everyone messes up you know so even when you know you should have seen me you know when i started soul winning you know, yeah i bit i had a bit of natural ability to speak because i'd done some public speaking and things like that I'd done sales before but you know i was still like you know fluffing about trying to find things not showing what to say people ask you questions and you're like you know i'm not really sure you know so it's just all part of the process isn't it? I saw this video, uh, you know, this short once, and somebody's like working out in the gym, they, they drop the bar, and you know, it's a bit embarrassing, and then somebody else in the gym just, hey, you know, it's, it's just all part of the process. You know, just get up and try again. And I'd say that about, about the Christian life. You know, don't worry, you get embarrassed, you fumble one, one day you didn't know the verse, or one day you, know, you didn't know this or didn't know that, you made a fool of yourself. Hey, it's just all part of the process, all part of the learning process. Just get up and try again. So first one is be ready. Be ready. We saw Paul was ready. Second one we see here in Acts is, you know, create your opportunity. Create your opportunity. See, Paul was there before Agrippa, before Festus. But, you know, do you, can you say that it was all luck? No. I mean, he appealed unto Caesar. He put himself in that situation. He created those opportunities to be able to preach before governors and kings. He wasn't just waiting around, you know, oh, you know, maybe somebody will ask me about it, you know. No, we go out there and we create the opportunity to be able to meet people that are willing to listen and willing to learn so we can preach the gospel to them to a captive audience. So Paul may not have known that he would be in that exact situation. But you can't say that it wasn't, that situation didn't arise through his actions. You know, he was out there looking for opportunities to preach the gospel, getting, got into, you know, trouble, appealed according to his rights as a Roman, and he found himself in the presence of Agrippa and all these other nobles being able to give a defense of the gospel and a defense of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What an amazing uh, opportunity. But, you know, it wasn't just luck. Uh, he created that opportunity by the things that his, he did, his actions. This is why I love this verse. It's one of our memory verses, and I know I go to it a lot, but this is why I love this verse. Ecclesiastes 9.11, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. What is this verse saying? Why is this an encouraging verse? Because it's saying it's not, always the, it's not always the strongest that wins the battle. It's not always the wisest that gets the bread. You know, it's not always the best and brightest that make it. You know, so I was talking to Peter about this recently with soccer, and I talked to Simon about this. It's like, it's like in, you know, in any sport, you, know, you bring your kids to sport, you see the kids that have the natural talent, don't you? But then what happens when they hit like their teenage years? Well, the natural talent might have given them a head start, but when they hit their teenage years, it's about... Who, had, who put in the work, right? Who put in the effort? Who, you know, maybe thought about it more, you know, dedicated the time to practice and practice. And they're the ones that actually start excelling over the ones that have natural talent. So it's like that here. You say, oh, you know, well, this person does this, this person can get into, uh, you know, get, or has all these opportunities to do that. Is that really the case? Or is it just that they work harder? They create that opportunity. You know, even in business, they say there's no such thing as luck. You know, luck is just when hard work meets opportunity. 
And it's like that in the spiritual life too. You know, why do you get more opportunities to preach the gospel? It's because when you are consistent and you're persistent and you put in the work and you put in the effort and you practice and practice and practice and you learn, you will find yourself in more opportunities, even out soul winning. You know, I have no doubt that, th there, that, that the way you present yourself, the way you introduce yourself, you know, that can tip the scale on people that are at the door or out at street evangelism to listen to you or not. Right? So, yeah, there are the people that don't want to listen no matter what you try. And then there are the people that even if you fumble and stutter and have no idea what you're doing, they don't want to listen. They'll be asking you because they're inquisitive. But there are those people as well that are on the fence and they're deciding in that moment, do I want to hear what this person has to say? And what you say and how you present yourself may be the difference between whether you have that opportunity or not. And for many of us that have gone soul winning for a long time, you know, sometimes your first impression of the person when you first speak to them is, oh, this person's probably not going to listen, this person's probably not going to get it. And then as you talk, this, this, maybe this, sometimes this person ends up getting saved. And you would have never assumed that from the beginning of the conversation. But, you know, if just, you know, based on experience, based on what you, you know, that, that situation might turn itself around. But was it luck? Maybe some of it was luck, but, you know, it's hard work meets opportunity. That's what I think. Like in Ecclesiastes 9.11, it's not always the fastest that wins the race. So create your opportunity. Number three, what else do we see here from Paul? Number three, be respectful. Be respectful. Look what he says, Paul says here in Acts 26 3, especially because I know thee, who's he talking about, Agrippa? I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews, wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. So notice here, I mean, they're not going anywhere. He has, he's in chains, and Agrippa has obviously invited everyone there, but he still gives Agrippa some praise to say, look, you are, he's knowledgeable. You know, he's not an idiot and you know same when it comes to soul winning you know paul was not insulting or rude and we don't need to be insulting or rude we should be respectful when we preach the gospel sometimes new believers you know they go out and they preach the gospel they're passionate they're zealous but also they, they take offense too easily you know if you take offense then you start taking it personally you know and you know you start being rude and things like that disrespectful and sometimes as well, like new believers are not used to, you know, maybe people don't want to hear. It's like, you know, soul winning is like a sales job, right? If you're in sales, you got to know that people aren't always interested. People are going to be rude. People don't necessarily want to hear what you have to say. And you, that's why you have to be, be wary of that as a new soul winner. That, yeah, there's, more, there's going to be more people that say no, they don't want to hear, listen to what you have to say, then say yes. That's just the nature of any sort of sales or marketing, which is what evangelism is, really. It's just that we're not selling a product or service. We are promoting a course, right? So we have to make sure we are always respectful in the way we talk to people. We have to remember, we are inconveniencing them when we stop them on the street. We are knocking on their door. It's not for us to get offended. It's not for us to demand their time. We should be polite and respectful, them giving us their time. And then, you know, that speech will come along across a bit more tasty, like the Bible says in Colossians 4, 6. You know, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man so notice the proportions there in colossians 4 6. you know truth if you think about truth as like salt you know and grace is like the kindness and the respect that you show people it says here let your speech be always with grace seasoned with salt you see sometimes people's speech is too salty if it's too salty it's not going to be received as well as speech that is grace so notice here paul you know, he praises Agrippa. And not only this, I mean, Agrippa has asked him to come and, you know, give it a defense. But he still, you know, he says, I beseech thee to hear me patiently. He is asking politely, please listen and uh, please pay attention to what I'm saying. So not only is Paul not insulting or rude, he's respectful, but he also asks for their full attention. And this is why I think it's a good idea when we 
preach the gospel, you know, that we ask if people want to hear what we have to say. Yes, there's an opportunity for them to say no, but at the same token, we want an attentive audience. We want, when we're explaining to somebody, for them to be listening, because I feel as though if you don't really have their consent to explain this to them and they want to hear what you have to say, I think what's happening in their mind is they're just waiting for an opportunity to end that conversation and they're not really listening to you. So I'd rather not waste my time with somebody that's just being polite, you know, not listening. Now, I want them to actually be listening and I find that if you ask for permission to explain, it helps ensure that you have their attention uh, you know, when you're going through the information and you really want them to understand what you're saying. So notice here, because sometimes people say, oh, you know what, Jesus was harsh. You know, and they sort of people try and use that as a justification to be harsh. Yeah, you know, there's a time and place to be harsh. But notice who Jesus was harsh with. He wasn't just harsh with unbelievers in general that just were not interested in what he had to say. He wasn't harsh with people that were asking him questions and had genuine objections. He was harsh with the religious leaders of the day that were misleading people down the path of heresy or false religion. So the way he treated the scribes and the Pharisees and the way he spoke to them, yes, was very different to just people that were, you know, maybe had the wrong motive, wrong intention. I'm just trying to show you a contrast here. But still, look here in Matthew 23. Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. Look at this, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? So yes, Jesus obviously exchanged some harsh words, but that's not how Jesus dealt with everyone. I mean, look at here. I want to show you this contrast here in John 6. John 6 is after he fed a multitude with bread and with fish. Now they're following him. But they're following him for the wrong motives, right? They weren't following him because of Jesus, because of the truth. They just wanted something from him. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, look at this, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father's seal. So notice here that he's, he's not insulting them, but he's explaining, hey, look, you're chasing the wrong thing. It's like when we explain to something, hey, you know, you're believing on the wrong thing, but then it's not insulting, it's not rude, it's not name-calling. We're just explaining to them the truth in love. Then, then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto him, said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him, whom he hath sent. So you see, it's not about working your way to heaven, it's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, let's move on. What's the next thing we can learn from Paul's experience here in Acts 26? Number four is know your audience. Know your audience. So we notice there, I'll just go back here to Acts 26 3. It says, he, especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. So you see, Paul. Paul knew in Acts 26 who King Agrippa was. So you see there he's going to engage with governors and kings. He knows he's going to give a defense of the gospel. He doesn't just go in there and give a cookie-cutter method of explaining. He thinks about the demographic of people he's going to address, and he adapts his message. Yes, he's given the core message across, obviously the Jesus Christ and him crucified, but then he's tailoring it to the people that he's talking to. And I think we have to do that too. You know, oftentimes new Christians, you know, they learn the plan of salvation. And then no matter who they're talking to, they're just going through the plan of salvation. No matter, it doesn't matter what, you know, what knowledge that person has. They just say the same things no matter what. And I don't think that's wise. You know, like say you're talking to somebody with a Christian background. You may not need to emphasize other points. You know, you can, you can brush over some points based on what they know to get to the things that they don't know and be more effective in how you're communicating. You know, if you're talking to a Jehovah's Witness, if you're talking to a Muslim, if you're talking to an atheist, you may start on a different point based on what their objections are, what you assume, assume their knowledge to be because of what you know that they know, because you know 
you're trying to know the sort of people that you're talking to, like Paul here. So Paul knew who Agrippa was and what he would know. But you know what it shows me as well is you know it shows that Paul was not ignorant of the political figures of his day. Like he knew Festus, he knew Felix, you know, King Agrippa comes, and he's like he knows hey the background of these people. So he wasn't completely ignorant of the people that ruled over them, even in the Roman Empire. So you know obviously I think as well Christians are too ignorant of what's happening in politics, not happening you know knowing what's happening in the world that they live in, and it's unfortunate. Because, you know, Paul obviously was not ignorant of the rulers of his day. So Paul here knew his audience, and he alludes to this in 1 Corinthians 9, when he's saying he, he relates to people. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. So why did he have that mentality? He had that mentality because it made him a more effective soul winner. It made him a more effective soul winner. So it's ineffective to use a single approach just for every type of person. All right, let's move on. Next one we see here when it comes to witnessing and learning from Paul is personal testimony. Personal testimony. Acts 26.4 says, My manner of life from my youth which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews. So Paul goes into his, his history, you know, and his life, and how he got to the point where he was, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. So he says, you know, not only am I saying my testimony, but you've asked others about my past. This is what they would know. So... Paul uses his personal background to relate to his audience, right? And it adds sincerity to his message, doesn't it? So that's, that's a tip as well for us when we're talking with somebody and we're explaining the gospel. You may allude to your history, and your, especially if, if the person has a similar history. That's often what happens when I talk to uh, atheists. I'll say, you know what, I used to believe that too. And I understand, like, you know, it's what we're taught in high school, it's what we're taught in primary school, and, you know, a lot of people, so it's, it's you, you're trying to say, look, I can relate to you, I, I know how you feel. So, you can use your testimony, like I said, to relate to the person you're talking to, to add sincerity, but what I will say about personal testimony is, your testimony is not a replacement for the gospel. You know, that's often taught in a lot of churches. Oh, you know, no, you don't have to preach the word. Just share your testimony, man. You know, but your testimony is not the gospel. And you know what? The danger of replacing the gospel with your testimony. So I'm not saying that don't share your testimony. I'm saying your testimony is used to relate to the person, add some sincerity. But the danger of thinking that your testimony replaces the gospel, your testimony is what has, has the power, is that you may end up, uh, what's the word, like in, in uh, like not, not purposefully, uh, what's that word I'm looking for? You know, you know, do it on purpose. Preaching a work salvation. Why? Because what is your testimony? Your testimony is about how you changed, where you, where you were before, where you are now. That's not the gospel message. The gospel message is the death, burial, and resurrection. The gospel message is not about what you do. The gospel message is about what Jesus did. So your personal testimony can in no way replace the gospel. It is just a tool that you might use to relate to the person, to get some warmness and rapport, so that the message of the gospel, which is the death, burial, and resurrection, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, pointing them to the Saviour, not pointing them to you, can get through. But you need to make sure you make that distinction because your testimony, like I said, is not the power of the gospel. What is the power? It is the gospel, like at Romans 1.16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So your personal testimony, yes, is a tool, but don't replace the gospel with it. It is not the power of salvation. The gospel of Christ is the power. And that's why anything tool that we use is about 
pushing people, directing people to the truth, which is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Number six. Number six. Oh, we see it from Paul. Know your Bible. Know your Bible. Now, it goes without saying that Paul was a student of God's word. You know, he knew what he was talking about. But here, that's, that's the point here, is that, yes, he was a student of the Bible. He knew what he was talking about. He knew what the scriptures taught. And this is why he says in Acts 26, he says, And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto the fathers. You now he's noting now what the scriptures are talking about. Unto which promise our 12 tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. So you see how he knew the scriptures, he knew the Bible, so he could confidently speak on the word of God. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. So you see here, Paul had an intimate knowledge of God's word, didn't he? And that's what the Bible commands us to do. The Bible says here in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Because, see, it ought to be a shameful thing. It ought to be a shameful thing to be a Christian and not know the Bible at all. You know, not know what you're talking about. So, this is why the Bible's saying here, you need to study, study reading the word of God, meditating on the word of God, you know, knowing what scriptures mean what, and how to defend your case, and support what you believe from the Bible, because if you don't, the Bible says you're going to be ashamed. It's a shameful thing not to know what you're talking about, not to know the Bible. See, and if you know the Word of God, then you don't have to rely on emotional arguments. You know, this is why the crowd that uses their personal testimony and, you know, it's trying to write, it's, it's, a lot of that is sometimes just appealing to emotions, you know, getting people to feel a certain way as opposed to teaching them certain truths. And it also means you're ready to defend against objections. So if you're explaining something to somebody and they ask questions, they raise objections, then you'll know how to answer them. And then you'll create that opportunity like we talked about prior. All right, let's move on. We've got a few more. Number seven. Number seven is relating to your audience. Relating to your audience. Now, we already talked about personal testimony. That's one way to do it. But you can also relate not just to the positives of your testimony, but to the faults as well. Acts 26, verse 8. Why should, it, why should it be thought, this is Paul, a thing incredible with you, so incredible, see we use the word incredible a little bit differently, as in that's great, but incredible meaning he's saying it's, it's unbelievable. So we use the terms incredible and unbelievable in the positive sense, but he's just saying it's not something that has any credibility, it's not something that can be really incredible with you, that God should raise the dead. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. So not only did he give his personal testimony in terms of his upbringing, but notice here that he's alluding to the things that he had wrong. So it's like you can use your own testimony and talk about, you know, I used to believe this, I used to do this, and you know, to relate to the person. Which thing, verse 10, I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them off in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. So it's a similar point about personal testimony. It's a similar point about knowing your audience. But, you know, you can look to your faults in the past. You can look to the things that you believed wrong to relate to the person that you're talking to, especially if they express the same things. So like I said with atheism, you know, I would say the same thing. Like, I used to be like that too. Or, you know, maybe when people are talking about their sins and they say, oh, you know, they'll say things like, oh, you know, I've done terrible things in my life and you know, I, I don't, you know, I know that I'm, you know, I'm a sinner and... You can relate to that. You say, you know, I've done terrible things too. And you can talk to them. And this is not only something wise to do in evangelism, but this is, this is a, a sort of sales tactic too. I don't know if you ever heard, heard of the sales tactic 
Uh, it's called feel, felt, found. You know, when you're trying to sell something to somebody. And, you know, that's what we're doing when we're preaching the gospel. We are selling a message. We're communicating a message. We're not selling a product or service. But salespeople often use that same tactic. Feel, felt, found. You know, they express an objection to you. You say, I know how you feel. I felt the same way. Do you know what I found? And you go on to explain to them. So you can turn that objection around. So it's the same when you talk to people at Soul Winning. You can use a similar way. You say, you know, I was like that too. I know, because this is how I was raised. Or this is what I did, you know. And I felt the same way you did. But then I found out that that's not how salvation is obtained. It's not obtained through merit. It's not obtained through works. It's obtained through Jesus Christ. So the negative points in your testimony also help to relate to your audience. And this is what we see Paul here when he says, hey, he was the chief of sinners. He persecuted Christians. And he's bringing that out in this defense, like I said, to relate to the people listening to him. And number eight, number eight is preach the gospel. Now this one goes without saying that if you're going to do evangelism, you need to have some knowledge in preaching the gospel, you know, learn the plan of salvation. You know, I always tell new people, you know, just learn the five points that we preach start with a template and then as you get better you can then start to deviate from that template and then implement your own little nuances in how you explain the gospel but it's good that when you start off new that you just learn the the the, the basics of the steps the five point plan of salvation that we have in our gospel track look at what paul says here now paul doesn't necessarily preach the gospel here but he is talking about his encounter with jesus christ so he's pointing people to jesus whereupon as i went to damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest at midday o king i saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me and when we were all fallen to the earth i heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why per persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the priest. Now you might say, you know, we would never use that approach today when preaching to people. People might think we're crazy. People might think, you know, so, you know, a lot of Christians are like that. They have a supernatural experience or they have a vision and then they use that testimony to try and preach the gospel. And sometimes the person that they're preaching to is not somebody that thinks that those sort of encounters even happen. They might think they're a little bit weird. And this is why you need to know your audience. You know, you can't just be, you know, somebody that is completely disconnected with what the person you're talking to thinks is weird or not, because you want to be able to relate to them. So yeah, maybe if you're talking to a Christian that already accepts those sorts of things, and you explain to them your encounter or you know your experience they may be able to relate to that but i mean if you're talking to an atheist i mean you're not going to talk about the power of god in your life and all these things i mean you're going to give them more facts and figures and explain to them because that's probably what's more going to convince them so i think here in paul i mean paul obviously lives in a day where people are more open to these dreams and these visions and things like that like the jews are seeking for a sign you know, the Romans believed in a lot of supernatural things as well with their pagan religion. So I think the fact that he alludes to the, the fact that he met Jesus and Jesus, you know, why was he, what was the whole point of him saying that he met Jesus? Because it was, he was proclaiming that Jesus was God. Right? He met Jesus and then Jesus is saying, hey, I am the Lord that you're persecuting. When we're all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And when I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. So this is why I think his encounter is important and that he shares it, because it is proving to them that he saw the risen Jesus, because he's trying to prove the resurrection, and that Jesus is the God that we ought to worship. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. So Jesus giving Paul the commission to be this evangelist, 
So he's explaining this to Agrippa and to the people there to explain why he does the things that he does. And sometimes we do that too. People ask, you know, haven't been outside, and he's like, why are you guys here? Why are you guys knocking on doors? So we give the explanation. This is why we're here. Because Jesus Christ, because people are going to, you know, people of their sinners and are not saved will go to hell. This is why we're out here to preach the gospel, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. See, so that's the gospel there, right? He's preaching the gospel that people would believe, be free from the power of Satan. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. So he not only was preaching the gospel, but he was also preaching righteous living as well to those that believed on Jesus Christ. So that's what Paul's mission was. Paul's mission was the Great Commission, like our mission is. So Paul describes his encounter with Jesus Christ. And like Paul was different when he met Jesus Christ, and we don't, this is not when, I don't believe this is when Paul got saved. You know, Paul got saved, remember, when he went to Damascus and then uh, Ananias preached to him and that's when he got saved and that's when he got baptised. But when people have an encounter with Jesus Christ, they're different, aren't they? You know, this is why. Having an encounter and getting to know Jesus, because he got to know who Jesus really was, he was the Lord, that ought to give you a new mission. It ought to need to give you new values, give you a new perspective, give you new priorities, give you a new purpose, you know, give you a new vision. And that's why when we get to know God in his word and the more we get to know God, it ought to change you. And it will change you if you spend more time with Jesus. Right? Look at what Jesus says here. <clears throat> it's very important that we proclaim Jesus Christ as God when we preach the gospel. They need to believe that Jesus Christ is God. And this is why I think Paul makes the point when Jesus said, you know, who art thou, Lord? He says, it is, I'm Jesus whom thou persecuted. Because he's making the point that the risen Jesus is God in the flesh. John 8, 23. Look at what Jesus says here. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? So isn't that similar to what, what Paul said? Jesus said unto them, even the same that I said unto you from the beginning, I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. So you see how he's referring to a him, referring to a he, and Jesus said, if you believe not that I am he. So what is Jesus saying then? You must believe that he is God the Father. Right? God in the flesh. That's uh, point number eight. So preach the gospel. Makes you preach the important bits. You know, the death, burial, and resurrection. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But you also have to believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Number nine. She's got three more. Trust in the Lord. So as we go out and we're preaching the gospel, we're trying to do a work for God, we need to trust in in the Lord. So Paul also, look at here in verse 21, Acts 26. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day. Now, of all people to rely on his own wisdom, rely on his own effort, now, did Paul have those things, and do they help? Of course. But of anyone who could exalt himself and say, like, well, I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm talking about. You know, I have the experience. And, and yet, Paul, even with his wisdom, his revelations, his experience, he knew he had to trust God. And he knew that God helped him, and that's why he is there to this day, witnessing both to small and great. 
saying none of the things that those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. So again, he's alluding to the fact that he knows the scriptures as well. He's saying, hey, I'm not saying anything different. But he recognizes that he needs to trust God. So we want to make sure that even though we learn, we gain experience, that we go out there with the knowledge that we can't do anything without Jesus Christ. You know, for without him, we, can, we can't do anything, right? So it's because of Jesus Christ that gives us the strength, gives us the ability and the power to go out there and make a difference, right? So we don't want to lift ourselves up as to be anything great like Paul did. And that's why he says in 2 Corinthians, that's why he was given the thorn in the flesh, lest he should be exalted above measure. Right? And he was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet him. So let's always remember in anything we do that we acknowledge God and that we trust him to bring us through. Psalm 18, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. You know a good sign to know whether you trust the Lord rather than just trusting in your own abilities is whether or not you pray. You know, prayer is a sign, it reveals how much you trust in God, I believe. Because it's like, it's like in real life. I mean, if you don't need somebody's help, why would you ever go to them? You just go, I'm just going to do it myself. So that's the attitude Christians can have. I'm just going to do it myself. And then what happens? They don't go to God in prayer. Why? Because you feel you don't need God's help. I mean, if you don't pray, do you not need God's help? I think we need God's help. You know, not only do we need it, I think I would want God's help. I mean, we have a, it's like having an untapped resource. You know, you have the God of the universe willing to help you. And yet when you don't pray, you're not tapping into that resource. I mean, that's kind of foolish, first of all. And second of all, I mean, is it prideful to think that you go through your Christian life without asking God for help? So verse 3, I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Psalm 20, verse 6, another one. Now know I that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots, and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Notice there in verse 7, you see how when they're going to fight a war, he says, hey, some people, they trust in their abilities. They trust in their equipment. They trust in the, the weapons that they have. But he's saying, no, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. So same with evangelism. Don't go out there just trusting in your knowledge, trusting in your abilities. You know, pray to God. Ask God for help. Why not tap into that resource? He's there, ready to hear, ready to help. Why would we be so foolish not to ask for help? And why would we be so prideful to think that we don't need his help? Right? Let's go on. Two more. Verse 10. Zeal without offense. Zeal without offense. Verse 24, Acts 26. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. Now mad in the King James Bible, he's not angry, right? Mad, he's saying you're crazy, right? It's like when the Bible talks about speaking in tongues and he says, don't they come into church saying you're not mad? He's saying you guys are crazy. So he's saying here, much learning doth make thee mad. Now why would he say that? Because do you think Paul is in chains? He's preaching the gospel. And he's just like going through the motions. Oh, yeah, you know, Jesus rose again for the Easter. So, you know, I'm sure he had some passion. He had some zeal. You know, he had some enthusiasm. You know, when you do things for God, do it with some passion. Do it with some zeal, but without offense. What do I mean by that? Because sometimes you need to be aware. You have to try to strike that balance because zeal often can come across as pushy. So you want to be passionate but you want to also beware not to be offensive and not to be pushy. But we need to find that balance of, of zeal and gentleness. 
And obviously Paul had passion, right? But he also had the humility, he had the respect, and he had all these other things that we're talking about. To the point where Festus, they're listening to Paul preach this message, and Festus is saying, Paul, you're crazy. What's going on? You just, you just learn all this stuff. You know, he's just mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. I feel like in these next couple of verses, you can almost hear the way Paul is just begging Agrippa and begging his listeners, please believe. Think about the passion that he would have to have to, to be like this, right? And this is what we should be like when we talk to people. You know, you want to be passionate, you want to be zealous, and just be careful not to be too pushy. He says, for the king knoweth of these things before whom also I speak freely. I mean, maybe I'm reading my own voice into this, but, you know, when you read this passage, don't you see like this, ah, just please, please, for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And you know, that's some of the saddest words that can be spoken. Somebody gets so close to salvation, and it's almost. They're not saved, but they know and understand what you're saying. And it just goes to show, you know, there's, there's three types of people, right? There's, there's the Christian that Paul represents, there's the non-Christian that Festus represents, and there's the almost Christian. Uh, and the sad thing is that the almost Christian will go to hell just like the non-Christian. And it just goes to show that it's, it's not enough for somebody just to understand the gospel message. Because there are people that understand what Jesus did. They know why you need to believe on Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean they, they themselves believe on Jesus Christ. So it's not just the knowledge of the gospel. You need to believe it as well. So it's the saddest words here that King Agrippa, you know, for whatever reason, he says, almost thou persuadest me. To be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am. So he's saying, it's not enough almost. Altogether such as I am, except these bonds. And you can imagine, just imagine the scenario there. He's in this room with all the nobles. He's chained up. And you know, maybe when he's speaking, the chains are rattling. And as he says this final saying here, you know, I wish you guys were like me, except for these bonds. You know, I don't want you to have to go through this persecution. You know, the, 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 just, the, just imagine being in that place. I mean, I would have loved to, you know, go on a time machine and just like view like what's going on back there. Uh, maybe we'll get to do that in heaven. You can ask Jesus, can you just like play the tape back and, and see, see I, can, I can view, the, watch the movie of this, of Acts 26? So, zeal without offense. Zeal without offense. See, so it's not enough just to know the gospel. You need to believe the gospel. Hebrews 4.1 Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Look at this. But the word preached did not profit them not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Man, I hope you are not that person. Don't be that person. You, know, you never really know who's saved in church. Obviously, if they say that they're saved, that's the best you can know. But you know yourself, right? I don't believe salvation is by works. You, know, you don't have to prove that you're saved to anyone else. But, but don't, don't, please don't be the person that goes to church Here's the gospel again and again and again and again. You understand the gospel, but for some reason in your heart, you just haven't believed it yet. You haven't accepted it. Because that person is not saved. The Bible says here, you know, the gospel was preached unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So don't be that person. Knowledge of the truth alone doesn't say it. You must believe it. And the last point in this evangelism masterclass from Paul, number 11 is boldness. The boldness that he had. 
So we saw there in the last couple of verses, obviously being willing to talk to nobles, to governors, to kings, boldly proclaiming. And what we see here in the last couple of verses in Acts 26, it says, And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up, and the governor, and Benaiasi, and they that sat with them. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, Look what they said. This man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bond. So we see at the end of Acts 26, they acknowledge this man's innocent. Paul has not done anything wrong to deserve these chains. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. So he's still only in captives because he appealed to Caesar. Right? But there's all the other things that were happening, all the, the plans to assassinate him and everything like that. But they acknowledged here that Paul was innocent. Now, what's the point I want to draw from this? Is yes, Paul was bold. Yes, did he have some supernatural boldness? I don't doubt that. He prayed for boldness. I'm sure God gave him supernatural boldness. But you know, other things your boldness can be based on, your boldness can be based on your knowledge. Like, do you know the word? So Paul here, why is he confident? Because he knows what he's talking about. Like, he knows the scriptures. He has conviction. He believes what he has learned. And not only that, I think a big part of why people are not confident in being bold in their faith is because godliness matters as well. See, the way you live, your righteousness, your you know, lack of worldliness, your godliness, how you present yourself, what sort of Christian you are, will impact how confident you are in talking to others about Christianity. And this is why I think he, we see here at the end you know, what was Paul's reputation? Man, he's innocent. This man knows what he's almost thou persuaders me to be a Christian. And I think this is what creates boldness as well. So if you want to be bold in your witness, you know, get knowledge, pray for help, and also live righteously, strive for godliness. Because the more godly you live, no doubt you will be more bold in your witness for Jesus Christ. Last verse, Acts 4.13. Look at this. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. So isn't that, isn't that interesting that they were fishermen but they, they knew that they were bold in what they believed. They knew that they had been spending time with Jesus. So this is why. It's not your stature. It's not your worldly knowledge of worldly wisdom. It's not how, how many degrees you hold, how many letters you have after your name. Your boldness is going to come down to the time you have spent with Jesus. And how do we spend time with Jesus? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. You spend time in the Word of God, right? The more time you spend in the Word of God, that's how you spend time with Jesus. Yes, when Jesus was manifest in the flesh and he was walking on this earth, they spent time with him physically. But how do we spend time with him spiritually? The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. That's how you spend time with Jesus. All right, so in conclusion, we get this evangelism masterclass from Paul. One, be ready, create your opportunity, be respectful, know your audience. You know, use your personal testimony to relate. It doesn't replace the gospel. Know your Bible. That's going to add to your boldness. Relate to your audience. You know, feel felt found. Preach the gospel. Make sure Jesus, they know Jesus is God. Trust in the Lord, not in your own abilities. Ask for help. Zeal without offense. Be passionate about the things you're talking about. Careful not to be pushy. And 11, have boldness. What's going to help your boldness? Knowledge, conviction, godliness. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the, the testimony of Paul. Thank you that his life encourages Christians for many, many generations and for many generations to come. 
Lord, I pray that you will use the people here. May we not leave the same people we came. Lord, may we spend time with you. May we be bold in our faith. Lord, use your people. And may you give them a desire to want to be used by you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.